Hey, so you guys all have a very, very important final project coming up in week seven. It is your inferential statistics project. And I want to give you some very detailed help so that you can complete an excellent project and earn the highest grade that you can. If you go to topic seven in our Halo classroom and take a look at the inferential statistics project, you notice that you don't really see a whole lot of instruction, uh, but let's go through what we do have. You want to refer to the attached documents for further instructions and assistance. So the first thing that I want to tell you is this first attachment that simply says inferential statistics project. Don't use that one. You do not want to use that one. All it is, is just a very brief little bulleted set of instructions, okay? What you must use as you complete your project is the attachment titled Inferential Style Guide. That is required, you must use that. I'll show you what it looks like here in just a sec. The second thing that I wanna look at here is that the Excel data necessary to complete the calculations required in this project will be provided by your instructor. I will provide you the data. It will be attached to an announcement. You must use the data that I provide. If you use anything else besides the data that I provide, you will receive a zero, and I don't want that to happen to anybody. All right, so let's take a look at the inferential style guide that you are required to use. Here's what it looks like when you open it. It has all of the details. The first thing that you want to do is go to File, and save that as, because you want to save this document, I'm just going to save it in my downloads. And then the first word of your file name should be your last name. Please make sure that your last name is the first word of your file name. Okay, so I've just saved that. And now I can start entering my project into it. You suspect that among fraternal twins born across the United States, the second born twin has a higher resting heart rate from ages zero to two years. That's a really, really important phrase that your suspicion is the second twin's heart rate is higher than the first twin's heart rate. Uh, again, I'm going to provide you the data. Make sure that you get the data that I have provided. You will have 129 data points there and you want to answer the following and you're going to want to give some details. So let's look at number one, part A. Suppose the twin data were not provided to you and you had to collect the data yourself. The first thing you want to do here is discuss an appropriate experimental design and sampling strategy. An experimental design simply means how will you design this? Is it going to be something observational or will you apply a treatment? Your sampling strategy is the sampling strategies that we talked about in our classroom are things like, are you going to use a simple random sample or will you use stratified sampling or maybe cluster sampling or um, convenient sampling? Those types of sampling strategies are what you want to consider here. And whatever strategy you decide to use, how are you going to go about ensuring that your data is truly representative of twins across the US? And why might it be interesting to consider fraternal twins rather than identical twins? In part B, if again, if the data were not provided to you, here's where you want to discuss how you would determine the sample size. How do we determine sample size? Make sure you read that whole thing and address all of it. Number two, you want to select an appropriate hypothesis test. Part A, given that you have pairs of twin data and that each pair of twins shares an environment, making the pair's characteristics likely to be closer to each other than that of other twin pairs, what type of inferential test is appropriate for this case? So for example, will it be a um, one sample t-test or hypothesis test, or will it be a hypothesis test for proportions, or will it be a matched pairs hypothesis test? Notice that you have pairs of twin data. That's a huge clue right there as to what type of hypothesis test you want. Okay, in your response, you want to discuss what test you're going to choose, but you also want to select a different incorrect type of test and explain why the one you chose is correct and why the other one is incorrect. Okay, uh, your test will be, you'll have a 
0.05 level of significance and you're going to construct a 95% confidence interval. And what you wanna do here is not actually construct that. What you wanna do here is explain why the 0.05 significance level and the 95% confidence level are reasonable. Explain why it is generally crucial to fix those selections before you even start testing. Why do you want to have your significance level and your confidence level already in place before you even start testing? And why would it be wrong to wait until you see the data before you choose those things? Number three in part A, this part is not here. Let's see, let me get that out of there. I added that in. Here's where you want to state in mathematical notation your null and alternative hypotheses, okay? So you want to use the proper notation. Null hypothesis, make sure you use a subscript, H sub zero, and then follow that with a colon, and then you're going to then you're going to enter in your null hypothesis. Is my null hypothesis going to be something like, remember the null hypothesis is always a statement that there's no difference. Is it going to be something like mu1 is equal to mu2 or am I going to say d is zero? If I use the, the symbols for mean, which is that Greek letter mu, don't use the letter u, make sure you use the proper symbol and if you have like mu1 is equal to mu2, then below that you want to explain what those represent. What is mu1? What does it represent? What about mu2? What does it represent? And then when you give your alternative hypothesis, H sub one, again, make sure you use a subscript followed by a colon, and then, then that's where you'll present your alternative hypothesis. And again, use the correct symbols. In part B, you're just gonna state in words, verbally explain what your null and alternative hypotheses are. Please make sure you use complete sentences and correct grammar. Now, here in number four, this is where we want to start doing some calculations. Summarize your results here, including the calculation of any relevant means, standard deviations, test statistics, p-value calculations, etc. You need to summarize it here. I'm gonna show you in a different video how to use Excel to do these computations, but just note right here, you need to enter these in by typing it in. You can't just take a screenshot and paste it in there, not right here. Down here in part B, that is where you're going to want to take a screenshot. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to this and I'll show you in a different video how to do this one. Number five, you want to make a formal decision on your null hypothesis. In other words, is the null hypothesis going to be rejected or will you fail to reject the null hypothesis and why? Why, if you decide to reject it, why are you rejecting it? And if you fail to reject, why are you failing to reject it? And then in part B, here's where you want to kind of do the same thing. You want to translate your decision into an interpretation. If you rejected the null hypothesis, how do we interpret that? What does that really mean? Just kind of explaining it verbally, again, using complete sentences and correct grammar. And then number six, here's where you want to complete your confidence interval and summarize your results here. Again, this should be a text and not a screenshot. I am going to show you how, again, to compute that confidence interval, and then we'll take a look at what can go here. Part B is the value of zero inside or outside of your confidence interval. You'll be able to see that and explain what it would mean for the value zero to be inside your confidence interval. We'll come back to that one also. Number seven, discuss how to interpret your confidence interval. In detail, discuss in detail what your confidence interval tells us about the difference in the twins' heart rates at age one, and specifically provide a statement that would inform a lay reader, somebody who doesn't know a lot about this, how to interpret the lower bound and the upper bound of your confidence interval. Part B, does your confidence interval suggest the same result as the conclusion you presented in question five? So in question five, if you said, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis, right here, you're going to say, hey, my confidence interval supports that, or maybe it doesn't support it. If you failed to reject, again, down here, does, does your confidence inter support, interval support that or no? Number eight, consider the effects of increasing the sample size if it were increased to 1,290 instead of 129, 
but the pattern continued, what would you expect to happen to the decision on the null? So read that one real carefully, <clears throat> give a good discussion on that. And then number nine, consider some confounding variables. You want to list at least three possible confounding variables. Okay, so I'm, I think we have time to go ahead and look at the computations. So let's back back up here. We're going to back back up to number four, and we're going to complete our our relevant hypothesis text test calculations. Let me bring up some data. Okay, so here is some sample data, and let me emphasize here also, this is not the same data you will have. I have a whole completely different set of data, so you will not get the same numbers that I get. I just want to show you how to do this. So number four, we want to complete our relevant hypothesis test calculations. So let's do that. In order to do that, what I want to do is I want to go to my data tab. I'm going to scoot this over a little bit more here and go to data analysis. I want to use the data analysis tool. If you don't have this, please download it. If you are using Excel 365 through GCU, you might have to go to tech support in order to have them help you download this. Okay, so I go to my data analysis. I have all these options here. I know I'm doing a hypothesis test and I'm going to do a t-test paired, two samples for means. Click OK. Then I need to enter in where my data is. For variable one, that's going to be my firstborn twin. My data is in cell A1 through, so I enter a colon there. A130, since I have 129 values and my, my first row is just the label, I'm going to go down to row 130. My variable for my second range is going to be B1 colon B130. So that's where my data is. My hypothesized mean difference is zero. The, for the null hypothesis, it's always a statement that there's no difference. I want to check labels because I do have labels in that first row. The alpha of 0 0.05 is the default, so that's good. For my output range, make sure that you check this. You, want to, you don't want to have it in a new worksheet or a new workbook. So check output range, put your cursor in that little bar, and then just click on any empty cell. And then we click OK, and look at that. We've got these beautiful results here. Our results tell us what the mean is for the firstborn, mean for the secondborn, variance for each of them, how many observations we have. We don't really need the Pearson correlation. It tells us what our hypothesized mean difference is, how many degrees of freedom, t-statistics, and p-values. Now, here's one thing to notice. You have two p-values and two t-critical values. You have a set of these for a one-tailed test and for a two-tailed test. Please make sure that you only leave on there the one that is relevant to you. Are you doing a one-tailed or a two-tailed test? If you're doing a one-tailed test, delete the p-value and the critical value for the two-tailed test. Okay, so make sure that you do that. You do not want to submit both of them. So now let's go back over here to our template. Summarize your results, including the calculation of any relevant means, standard deviations, etc. And those you need to enter them in. So you want to type that in. This is where you do not put a screenshot. Over here is where you can put a screenshot in Part B. So for Part B, I can do some copying, highlight it, Control C, and then just Control V to paste that in. I don't want I want it to look nice, so I'm going to enter it as an image. I'm going to choose an image. Okay? All right. And you know, using your T stat and your P values and all that, that's what's going to tell you if you're going to reject your null hypothesis. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's get our confidence interval. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to insert a column because here's what we need. We need the difference in our means. So I'm going to take equals and then row a, or column A minus what's in column B, enter. So we're going to get all of our differences. So I'm just going to click and drag that all the way down until we have all of them. And then I'm going to get the mean difference and the standard deviation. I'm going to pause this while I do that. Okay, so I computed the difference, the mean of the differences, and also the standard deviation of the differences. Now I need that for my margin of error. So I want 
to go to my function and we want confidence.norm. That's going to be our function. Alpha is 0 0.05. The standard deviation, I'm just going to click on that. My sample size is 129. 129 differences. There's my margin of error. So I can compute my upper limit and my lower limit by subtracting this from the mean and adding